Let's hear the word of the Lord. For our offenses are many in your sight, and our sins testify against us. Our offenses are ever with us, and we acknowledge our iniquities, rebellion and treachery against the Lord, turning our backs on our God, inciting revolt and oppression, uttering lies our hearts have conceived. So justice is driven back, and righteousness stands at a distance. Truth has stumbled in the streets, honesty cannot enter. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on a righteousness as his breastplate, and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance, and wrapped himself in zeal, as in a cloak. According to what they have done, so will he repay wrath to his enemies, and retribution to his foes. He will repay the islands that are due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit, who is on you, will not depart from you. And my words that I have put in your mouth will always be on your lips, on the lips of your children and on the lips of their descendants. From this time on and forever, says the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Claire, and thank you to Sam also um, for leading us this morning. Um, so well. Just keep your Bible open. Uh, we're going to be thinking about these words this morning uh, from Isaiah chapter 59. Um, little babies are so helpless. Uh, little tiny babies are so helpless. They're incredibly vulnerable um, and unable to do anything really at all um, to protect themselves in, in this world. Any new parents in the room, um, you'll know exactly what I mean if you've got a little baby right now um, or you've been through that stage uh, recently. Babies are so helpless. I have a, a really vivid memory. I have lots of vivid memories from whenever our kids were little babies, but I have one really vivid memory of an incident when our firstborn, Caleb, um, was only a few weeks old. Um, Caroline was, was out of the house. I was downstairs in the back living room of our house at the time with Caleb lying on his back on the floor on his little play mat. Um, now, our house at that time backed on the building site. Out the back of us was just fields, and they were kind of building houses, and it was a bit of a, bit of a place for teenagers to hang out, um, particularly at the weekends. They would hang out there, often bored, and on occasions, of course, they would cause a little bit of trouble. And this particular evening, I was home alone um, with Caleb, enjoying some daddy time with my precious firstborn baby boy. He was happily lying there on the floor, um, smiling, drooling, kicking his little feet up in the air, when out of nowhere, a stone hit my back window hit the back double doors just behind us, a stone. Then another one, then another one, and another one. And then bang, a massive stone hit the back window behind me, almost shattering the glass of the double doors all over my helpless baby boy lying on the floor. You have no idea how quickly I moved in that moment up out the back door, honestly, across the garden, one foot on the little low deck fence, the next foot on the outside perimeter fence, and I was over the wall, over the fence, out into the building site, chasing whoever threw the stone at my window. I've never seen 14-year-old stone throwers run, run as quickly in my life. 
You'll be glad to know that nothing happened. I kept my calm. <laughs> and simply told them to never, <laughs> ever throw stones at my back windows ever again. What's the point? What's the point of that? Well, my little boy was helpless um, in that moment. He needed a defender. He needed a father to protect him, to act on his behalf. There was absolutely nothing in that moment that my helpless child could do to protect himself. He needed his dad to act in that moment. See, the truth is, as human beings, we're all helpless. We're all helpless, powerless in this life whenever it comes to what matters most. There's so much that is out of our control. And we need a God to act on our behalf. We need a God who will move, who will move towards the powerless, towards those who can't save themselves, towards those like us who need the help of our heavenly Father. In the first eight verses of Isaiah 59, the prophet reveals a people who are helpless. People have, the people of God have become helpless. Now, they're not like a little baby boy lying on the floor of a back living room, but we read that they, as a people, have been failing to live um, righteous lives. Their iniquities um, as Claire has read, their iniquities, their sins have separated them from God and, and God's face is, is hidden from them. And we know that they've been let down by their leaders. We heard a little bit about that last week. There's no integrity among them. There's no peace. There's no sense of justice. There's no righteousness. There's just verse 7 of Isaiah 59. There's a rushing into sin. And their offenses, the Bible says, are many in God's sight. Now, you'll maybe be glad to hear that there are no spears this week. But what we see in Isaiah 59 is a really helpless people, a people who have found themselves in great, great need of rescue. And by the time we get to verse 9, it reads like a, a corporate confession of a people who've been walking in darkness. Verse 10 says this, like the blind we group along the wall, feeling our way like people without eyes. At midday we stumble as if it were twilight, and among the strong we are like the dead. These people need help. They're in great, great need of help. They need God to move. They need God to act on their behalf. And so we get to verse 15, and the focus of, of Isaiah 59 completely shifts because God takes action. Let me just read these words again from verse 15 to verse 17. It says, The Lord looked and was displeased that there was no justice. He saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him, and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garments of vengeance as a cloak, and he wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. He wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. It was the story of the people then, and it remains the story of humanity today. We're all powerless in and of ourselves. We need God to move. We need God to act on our behalf one of the, the most important starting points of the Christian faith, if you're exploring faith in Jesus, if you're here this morning and, and you're kind of trying to figure out what it means to know him, um, to put your trust in him, well, one of the, the most important starting points of the Christian faith is to understand that we're all, every single one of us, we're born in need of rescue from the curse of sin. We need rescued. We need God to act. Alan Emerson and Adam Cox have written a book called The God Story. That's just out. I would recommend it. I'm starting to read my way through it. But here's what they say in The God Story, speaking 
about the disease of, of sin upon humanity. They write this, from the moment Adam and Eve bit into the forbidden fruit, sin infected the human heart. And like a self-destructing virus, it began to do untold damage to the image-bearing design. Sin, we can conclude, is not merely the bad things that we do, but an unrelenting force of independence which seeks to shape us in our inward being. The primacy of our own will, reinforced by culture's relentless pounding of the industry of self, is too strong for us to control. The psalmist, in a moment of sober awareness of his brutish innate selfishness, confessed, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Then hundreds of years later, St. Augustine would concur, Without you, what am I to myself but a guide to my own self-destruction? We all need God to act. We all need rescued. We all need a Savior who will save us. I want to draw two big thoughts that I think are really important from Isaiah 59. And here they are. Number one, his zeal has accomplished the victory and his zeal must clothe us daily. His zeal, the zeal of God in heaven has accomplished the victory and then his zeal must clothe us daily. His zeal has accomplished the victory. Isaiah 59, if you've picked up what's what's being said in that, in that chapter. We read that there was, there was no one, there was no man, no woman to lead the people back to God. No one was there. There was no one who was willing to do that. There was no intercessor who would step forward on behalf of the people. And so the image that we get in Isaiah 59, and I want you to picture this, the image we have is of God himself. Like a divine warrior, he steps forward and God, we read, puts on his armor in order to defend, uh, to defeat his enemies, to protect his people, and to glorify his name. And one moment in the Old Testament that illustrates this movement of God really well is the Exodus story. Immediately after God parts the Red Sea, providing supernatural rescue for his people as they escape from Egypt, that moment whenever Pharaoh and his, his chariots are chasing the people of God and, and the sea opens in front of them and, and God gives them rescue, they escape to the other side. We read after this moment, Moses and the Israelites sing a song of celebration. Sometimes I think when we recall that story, we just end there. We end at the parting of the Red Sea, and it's just this moment of, of miraculous provision. But right in Exodus 15, the next chapter, we read this moment where the people stop. They pause and they, they sing this song of celebration to God. Here's what they say in Exodus 15, 1 to 3. Moses and the people sing, I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver, he is hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. And then they sing, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Now, God is many things to us. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. He is the high king of heaven. He is God almighty. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth, but he is also our warrior. He is the God who fights for us. He is the God who goes before his people and who fights on our behalf. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. In Isaiah 59, we read that God puts on the breastplate of righteousness he puts on the helmet of salvation. He puts on garments of vengeance because remember that alone belongs to him and he wears a cloak of zeal. I'm sure some of you are probably thinking that's really like Ephesians 6, the armor of God. The armor of God in Ephesians 6, 10 to 17. That's, 
the passage that we often go to when we think about the armor of God, well, it actually originates in Isaiah chapter 59. In Ephesians 6, way later on, the Apostle Paul um, is drawing on imagery of the armor that would have been worn by, by Roman soldiers in his day. They would have had the breastplate on. They would have had a helmet on. They would have had a sword in their hand. But Paul is primarily drawing on Isaiah 59. He's seeing the soldier of his day, but he's remembering the scriptures of old. He's remembering this moment in Isaiah 59. And the most important thing for us to remember is that the armor is God's armor. That before we ever consider putting on this armor, we, we need to remember that it's his. That it's the armor of God. It's the armor that God himself wears. That he is the God who has put on the breastplate of righteousness. That he's the God who has put on the helmet of salvation. That he is the one who, who fights for us before we ever get into the battle. He's already in front of us. Isn't that good? It's good to remember that, that the armor is his. It's not our armor. We don't make it. It belongs to him. And it's by putting on his armor that we can, in the words of Paul in Ephesians 6, we can be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, taking our stand against the devil's schemes. See, we really need to put on the armor of God because the devil is our real enemy. The battle is not just flesh and blood. It's, it's beyond that. There is a, a dark enemy who wages war on the people of God. He is the dark force behind all earthly forces that come against us. And so we need to put on his armor the armor of God. We can't face our battles, any of our own battles, without first putting on the full armor of God. But crucially for me, it's the very armor that Jesus himself wore whenever Jesus walked on this earth, when Jesus walked all the way to the cross for you and for me. And this is really where we see the victory of God's zeal that he has accomplished. Just listen to what Colin Smith, one author, writes about this. He says that he, Jesus, wore the breastplate of righteousness to give you a righteousness that you do not possess. He wore the helmet of salvation to rescue you when you could not save yourself. He wore garments of vengeance to defeat the dark powers that oppressed you and to give them what they deserve. He, Jesus, dressed in zeal to enter this fight that you could not win and triumph so that you could not lose. I love that last bit, that Jesus dressed in zeal to enter this fight that you could not win and to triumph so that you could not lose. That's what Jesus has done for us. Sam has already mentioned Christmas this morning, so you'll forgive me for mentioning Christmas again. Whenever I worked in a previous church, there was a rule that we weren't allowed to mention the word Christmas until December. I, I would have been in big trouble at this stage. But at Christmas time, and we will read this, Isaiah chapter 9, we read this in Isaiah 9. This is a, a very familiar Christmas scripture. It says, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And then Isaiah says this, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. It's God's zeal that has acted on our behalf. It's God's zeal that has done the work that was needed to rescue us. And so a key, I believe, in this zeal series is that this zeal that we're talking about is not in here. 
It's not naturally within us. I hope you're learning that. That the zeal that we're talking about comes from God. It's His zeal. It belongs to the Lord. It belongs to our God who fights for us, who has gone before us. And so secondly, really importantly, His zeal must clothe us daily. The Isaiah 59 cloak of zeal is not mentioned in Ephesians 6. I have no idea why. I've tried all week to to think this through. Why is it not there? I'm sure there is a good reason. I'm still going to wrestle with that all week. If anyone has a good answer for that, you can bring it to me at any point. But the cloak of zeal, the cloak of zeal in Isaiah 59, it's really, really important. And we know that Roman soldiers would have also worn a cloak as part of their uniform, their outfit, as they headed in the battle. Their cloak, like their helmet and their breastplate and their sword, also played a really important role whenever they went on a military campaign. Their cloak was actually multifunctional. Apparently, a Roman cloak was made from heavy, unwashed wool, and so it provided warmth on cold days and nights. Its natural wooden uh, wool and oils would have made it virtually waterproof. And when the rains came, it would have kept the soldier dry, would have kept them from getting, as we would say, soaked to the skin. Soldiers often slept rough. They spent days, weeks, months away from home comforts. And so their cloak became like their bedding. It was capable of retaining heat and providing some welcome relief from the cold, hard, rugged ground underneath them. The Roman cloak wasn't a a weapon, but they couldn't go into battle without their cloak. It covered them. It protected their weapons. It kept them safe. Their cloak ensured warmer, drier, better rested, healthier, more content, whatever the circumstance, soldiers. Their cloak ensured that these soldiers were sustained for the long haul on the battlefield. Can you see the application of the cloak of zeal? We need to put the cloak of zeal on over everything else. As you go into battle again this week with your sword, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, as you put on the breastplate of righteousness, as you put on the helmet of salvation, as you put on feet ready to bring the gospel to the world and all the armor of God, you need to put on the cloak. You need to cover it all with the cloak of zeal. Over all of the other armor, it must cover us. Why why must it cover us? Well, primarily, I believe, because it speaks. The cloak of zeal speaks of all that Jesus has accomplished for us. All that the Son of God has accomplished has won for us at the cross and at the empty grave. The cloak of zeal, I believe, speaks of of Jesus' victory over Satan and sin, over shame, over injustice, over darkness, over illness, over hopelessness, and over death itself. The cloak of zeal covers everything else because it speaks of what Jesus has won for you and what Jesus has won for me. Jesus dressed in zeal to enter this fight that we could not win and triumph so that we could not lose. My desire is that you and I, that we would have this faith Now listen really carefully because this is important, that we would have this faith, this seal for Jesus, his church and his kingdom that would last a lifetime and beyond. That this seal that's within us would be for the long haul. That it would be for today, that it would be for tomorrow, that it would be for next week and next month and next year and all the way to the very end when we stand before the Lord. As zealous for him on that day as we were 
on this day. My heart's desire is that we would nurture faith within us, that God would equip us in the power of His Spirit to have a zeal that lasts for the long haul, that takes us all the way through this life, through days of exhaustion. Is anyone exhausted this morning? Through days of great distraction, through seasons of discontentment, through moments of utter weariness, through days of great despair, through moments of huge doubt, and even in in times of great fear, where we fear what the future holds, that through days of exhaustion and discontentment and disillusionment and weariness and doubt and fear, that every day we would put on the cloak of zeal that we wouldn't just try to do this all in our own strength. The cloak of zeal. I want you to spiritually feel that. I want you to spiritually feel the cloak of zeal upon you. That you would feel the weight of the, the beautiful weight of the cloak the cloak of all that Jesus has won for you, the cloak that speaks of everything that he has accomplished in your behalf. You need that. I need that. We need to know of that. We carry all of the other weapons, but we can't go into battle without the cloak of zeal. Here's why. Someone anonymously has written this. It's in those moments when the cloak of zeal does its best work. That's the power of the cloak. It keeps us warm in the bitter winds of difficult trials. It keeps us dry when the rains come and drench our expectations. And when we find ourselves exhausted and worn out, it offers us the promises of God as a shelter to rest and recharge before the next battle. The cloak of zeal makes that possible. I think that this is getting to the heart of the series that we're in. That we would be a people consumed by zeal. That through every season of our lives, through every morning that we arise and we just don't feel like facing that day, that we would put the cloak on. That the cloak of zeal would cover us. That it would bring warmth Shelter, strength, encouragement, power. That we would never go into battle without the cloak over our shoulders. Let me invite our worship team forward. We're going we're gonna to sing in response now. Why don't we stand together? Let's stand on our feet. I actually feel this morning that, that, that God is, is being really specific with, with, with some of us, but perhaps many of us. Really specific. You know exactly what it is. And this is in two regards, I believe. One, I wonder, are you, are you tired of the, of the battle? You're tired of the fight, but there are two things in that. Number one, that there's a very specific struggle in your life, a very specific struggle, and that might be a burden, that might be a longing, that might be a worry and a deep concern about something. It's a specific struggle in your life. Or it might be that you have a specific sin in your life that needs dealt with. 
I want to encourage you this morning to, to, to pray with someone on our prayer ministry team as soon as our time this morning finishes. Sometimes that is the most, oftentimes that is the most important moment on a Sunday morning. Maybe a specific struggle or a specific sin that you struggle with. But you're tired of the battle. Jesus dressed in zeal to enter this fight that we could not win. And he triumphed so that we could not lose. We are on the side of victory. He brings that to us. And so as we stand here just in this moment, just come before God in a posture of surrender and dependence. And before we sing, just feel the weight of the, the beautiful weight of the cloak of zeal. Put on the armor of God, but put the cloak of zeal over it all. Can you feel it? Can you sense it? We clothe ourselves in the cloak of zeal. God, we thank you for your armor. We thank you for giving us those weapons that we can fight with. But we thank you for the cloak that covers us. The cloak that speaks of all that Jesus has won for us. May we feel the beautiful weight of that upon our shoulders, enveloping us with a sense of your love, your peace, your compassion, your victory. Lord, enable people this morning who are maybe struggling with very specific struggles, come and meet them in their moment of need. May there be a moment of victory for them this morning as they cover themselves with the cloak of zeal. For anyone struggling with specific sin in their lives, God, we pray again that, that you would accomplish victory in their lives this morning over that. Whatever it might be, break strongholds. Give those people courage to speak with someone they trust. That they would step into this week with a renewed sense of victory in what Christ has done and will do within their lives. And now, God, as we wrap ourselves in the cloak of zeal, help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, giving thanks to our God who has accomplished what we could never, ever win in our own strength. So Holy Spirit, lead us in, in sung, responsive worship as we lift our hearts and our souls and our minds and our hands to you in praise. Lead us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship God.